Morning, everyone. To speak on behalf of the team of Reality and Oakland today, we have Anthony Lucero. So Anthony was born and raised here in Oakland, and he worked for Lucasfilm, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, where he worked on visual effects for the films Star Wars Episode One, Two, The Mummy, Pirates of the Caribbean, and many, many more. But his latest project, East Side Sushi, it's a full-length feature film that he wrote and directed, is about blending of cultures and gender. It's shot and based right here in Fruitvale, East Oakland. I want to welcome up on stage our speaker from Oakland, Anthony Lucero. Good morning. So yeah, I wanted to uh, spend this morning talking about uh, the ups and downs of making East Side Sushi. I do get a lot of questions of uh, what was your inspiration for making the film? Uh, but I also got a lot of questions of how. How did you make this film? I, I feel like it's a bit of a David versus Goliath type of film. It's such, a, such an indie film. So, uh, but I'd like to talk about more about my motivations for making the film as opposed to my inspirations. Because I'm inspired to make dozens of films, but it's the motivation is what I have a hard time with. Okay, so yeah, this is, um, you know what you want, go for it. It's Panda Express. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, um, so <laughs> you never know where you're going to get motivation from. So this is for, from a fortune cookie. And, uh, and I don't know what Panda Inn is. I don't know if do they have inns, I guess. But, uh, so, but anyways, I opened up this fortune cookie. I was like, yeah, I, I know what I want. I want to make a film. So I stuck it on my monitor about five years ago, and it's still there. I just took that picture a couple days ago. So you never know where you're going to find that. So... Uh, reality is the theme, and turning my screenplay into an actual film did become my reality. Then the reality of not being able to sell my film and distribute my film, that set in pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so a little bit about my background. Again, yeah, I worked for Lucasfilm for, I've been in the film industry for about 20 years. And I was one of those kids that was enamored with Star Wars. Empire Strikes Back was the world's greatest film. And uh, so I wanted to work for that company, and I eventually did. I worked for, for ILM. And I was happy there. And uh, I would do these short films every couple of years, and I would work on feature films. So this one particular film, just we busted our butts on and worked long hours, as you usually do in visual effects. And instead of being handed a bonus, I got handed a layoff notice. And as well as most of the people that were on that crew all got laid off. And that was sort of, at the time, this is what the company was doing. Once they were done with the film, they were done with you. So it was very, it was eye-opening. It was unexpected. Um, and it ended up becoming a blessing. Because I, I had to think about my future. Like, what, what am I going to do? I could be laid off at any moment from any company. So... I started to rethink about my future, and I started to diversify myself as a filmmaker. So then I started to work more in documentaries. I started to pick up a camera. I became a, a director of photography, an editor, and uh, started to just to, you know, mix it up. I, I did go back into visual effects. Uh, I, I worked for Tippett Studio in Berkeley. Uh, but as what normally happens with me is I hit the ceiling, and I get bored very quickly with everything. So I got bored with visual effects. And what happens is, it, 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 was this, it was this cycle. It was, I would work really hard on these films, the film would come out, and it would just fall flat. And me and my colleagues would sit there, and we would complain about the film, like, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Why the effects looked great, but the, stor the story was horrible. <laughs> um, yeah, and again, no disrespect to ILM. They're like family, and, and I love them. So, um, but the films would come out, and... Yeah, so I got tired of hearing myself complain about these films, and I thought, okay, I need to do something about it. Uh, if you think it's so easy to make a feature film, a good feature film, you should do it. So I was, I was like, okay, let's try it. So, begin anywhere. And that's what I did. Uh, these are actual cards. These are photographs I took. This is like on Solano Ave at a little card shop. And uh, I saw this, and I thought, yeah, I got to begin somewhere. 
And it was too cheap to buy it. I just took a picture of it. <laughs> um, so, but uh, East Side Sushi was going to be vastly different than the films I had worked on at my day job. It was not going to have the visual effects. It was not going to have explosions. No robots, no spectacles. It was going to concentrate on story, character development, acting, and that was it. Um, so for people who have no idea what film I'm talking about, uh, I will show the trailer. I have a little surprise. I think you're gonna like this, but first you have to be open to something different. Um, I see a rice. Um, what is it? That's what they call sushi. Taco. Like a Hay un restaurante en el centro que está buscando un asistente de cocina. Un restaurante. Osaka. Ochata. Osaka. You're a woman. Why would you want to work up here? See? I knew it. This is because I'm a woman. You know I can do this job just as good as any man. You want to become a sushi chef? You go try another restaurant. Not here. It is not a job for you. Andale, pa. A veces pienso que pues a ti como que te hace contento nada más estar trabajando así nomás, pero no teniendo éxito en nada. Contestants, remember to put your hands up when you are done. In three, two, one. I'm trying to have an opportunity like everyone else. I deserve an opportunity like everyone else. So there you go. Thank you. Has, has anybody seen the film? Oh, good show of hands, great, awesome, <laughs> two hands. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in all my other short films, I had uh, mixed cultures, mixed races, uh, and I, I, part of it, uh, it's because of how I grew up here in Oakland, that's just what I knew. It wasn't a conscious decision, that's just who I would cast in my films. Um, and, and I think, uh, in Eastside Sushi, it, it was probably the same thing, I don't know if it was conscious or unconscious that I cast two minority groups as leads. Uh, but it is a reflection of, of, of Oakland. Um, so, but now that I know this, and now like Oscar's so white and all these other hashtags that have come out, I do feel like now it's my duty to cast people that are underrepresented in films. So the LA Times, a couple years ago they did a, a study and they said that 15% of the lead characters are women, even though you make up 52% of the population. <laughs> The USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, they reported recently this year that 26% of women are now lead characters, so it's gone up a bit. Uh, but since there are two different studies, I'll just bring it in the middle and say 20% of the lead characters are women. So if we go to speaking characters, this is just, it's not lead characters, it's just speaking characters. 5.8 Hispanic Latino, 5.1 are Asian brothers and sisters are getting 5.1% of the pie, so it's pretty low. Now, if we were to break this down even further, and if we were to say uh, a Mexican, Japanese, lead, lead, or speaking characters, it would go down. If we were to say uh, Mexican immigrant, Japanese immigrant characters, we're, we're dropping quite a bit. A female, Mexican immigrant, lead character, it's almost non-existent. So, uh, you know, I, I, I knew this, but it didn't really matter. You know, I, I want to write film. I'm just writing films for people, and I, I want to write films that touch my soul. So had I known about these statistics when I was writing it, I wouldn't have cared. But I would go to these screenwriting seminars, and, uh, you know, they would tell you, you need to write action films, because th those do well overseas. Horror films. Uh, films for boys 13 to 18, right? And I'm sitting there like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, or if you can do it, write a film for 
male, female, boy, girl hit all four of those big demographics. So that's not what Eastside Sushi was about. Um, but I ended up writing Eastside Sushi and I sent the screenplay into, it's called uh, Screenplay Readers. They do coverage for your film and they tell you what's working, what's not working. So this is my first feedback from, this is the last paragraph. It falls short as it lacks substance in the storytelling process. We are mainly provided with elaborate cooking sequences versus storytelling while we enjoy learning sequences and the competition. There isn't much else going on with the plot and they passed on it. So that's my, that's my very first feedback on my screenplay. So, you know, maybe I, I should have given up. Maybe some people would have given up at that point, but there's this part of me where you tell me no. It just drives me to, to prove people wrong. Um, so, so with that, I decide I'm gonna move forward. <laughs> and how do I do this? Well, let me start pitching my screenplay. That's what I'll do. So there's these uh, pitch contests, sometimes they're run by studios, they're run by various organizations, you pay for them, sometimes you do it over the internet, and it's these rooms where these tables are lined up with uh, supposedly representatives from the studio. So they could be, uh, they could be acquisitions, head of acquisitions, they could be a production assistant. You don't know who you're talking to at these tables. And I would sit down and, hi, I have this film, uh, it's about a woman wants to become a sushi chef, and they would just like, Fall asleep. Hi, I'm, I'm doing a film about a, an immigrant, a Mexican immigrant wants to become a sushi chef. She's fighting gender and, and cultural inequalities and no, nothing. It was just next. Um, and then I had one guy from the studio, he's like, I need an action film for Mark Wahlberg <laughs> or Will Smith. Like he just straight up told me after my pitch. And I, and I was like, no, I don't see Will Smith being a female sushi chef. And, <laughs> He didn't laugh, and, uh, <clears throat> but uh, a side note here about these pitch fests and about these organizations where send in your screenplay for a competition or send us your short film or grant proposals and all, and these are things that I, I did endlessly and I got rejection after rejection after rejection. And it's depressing, it really is. And uh, after a while I just got fed up and I said, look, I'm not gonna look for other people's affirmation for my screenplay, I'm gonna do this myself. So. I'm not telling you to not do these things, but just don't put all of your hopes and dreams into these competitions, because a bazillion people are applying for, like Project Greenlight. I have people email me, you, you should apply for Project, Green, you know, Project Greenlight, where they take one filmmaker and they fund it and it's on TV and blah, blah, blah. So um, anyways, I, I stopped doing those a while ago. Uh, so how did I do this? So I started to, um, started to save my money, is how I started to do this, because I wasn't getting any kind of support. Uh, here's another card that I saw. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? So my answer was I would make a film. But this is a good one. I remember looking at this card thinking, yeah, what would I do? So uh, after I had written Eastside Sushi, uh, it sat there uh, for about a year after nothing. And then I decided, I think I could make this film if I hone it down, if I remove some characters, remove some scenes, I might be able to make it. And so I went into my manager's office. Um, actually, Vicky, who was sitting right here, was managing me at the time. And I said, um, I, I, th I think I'm, I'm gonna quit. And she says, you think you're gonna quit? <laughs> and I said, no, I, I, I'm quit I quit, I'm quitting. And she's like, okay, wh where are you going? I said, nowhere, I have nothing lined up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, but it's really hard to give up a steady paycheck, 401k, benefits, all this, right? And just for some stupid dream, you know? It's like, that's, but that's why we do it. We do it because we're passionate about our art, so I, I had to take that chance. Um, another side note, remember the, uh, when Disney bought Lucasfilm, and so, um, George Lucas gave everybody bonuses at that point. Everybody across and all my friends are like, oh my God, I've got these bonuses, we're buying cars. This was just after I made Eastside Sushi where I dumped all my money into it and I was so depressed, um, but it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so how was I gonna do this? Uh, so I, Indiegogo, that was like, yes, oh my God, crowdfunding, that's what I'm gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna make this. 
So I do an Indiegogo campaign, I do the video, I do all the, the, the awards and spend a lot of time crafting this and I needed $75,000, $75,000 would just, and I would put in my own money on top of that and we could barely squeak by. So I do the campaign and after taxes and fees, I made about $3,000. And yeah, it's true. So, and again, I probably should have stopped at that point. I felt like, gosh, I'm not getting, I'm not getting any positive feet. Nobody wants to see a film about a woman who wants to become a sushi chef. So uh, with that, I decided I was gonna fund it myself. So I paid for the entire film, but with the help of volunteers like Keith and, and my friend Chris, who housed my actor the whole time. Like, but this is a lot of the love and support that came to make this film. That's how it happened. So uh, yeah, half the crew was volunteer, half I, I paid for. I remember this was probably day three of, of doing the feature and I, I, we had this wall of all of the days of the next three and a half weeks of filming that we had to do. And this is my first feature film, this is the first feature most of us had tackled and I was stressing. I thought, God, I can't, we don't have an actor for that day, we don't have props for this day and it's just, just a stress wall to look at. And at the same time, uh, the A's were playing, I think, Detroit or something in the playoffs. And they were down two games to nothing in the playoffs. And they had to win the next game or they were going to be eliminated. So we're pl planning the next day. The TV's on the background. And the reporter asked that manager, he says, you have three games to win. you got to win all three in a row. How are you going to do that? And the manager says, I'm not worrying about winning the next three games. I'm worrying about tomorrow's game. We're going to win tomorrow's game. And then tomorrow, we'll think about winning the next game. I needed to hear that just at that moment, and I thought, yes, I'm gonna worry about tomorrow's shoot, and then we'll worry about the next day's shoot. So that, I forget who the manager's name was, I don't know, but um, it helped me quite a bit. So, now we're moving towards the film is done, it's edited, and this is me on, on the bus going to Lucasfilm, so in the morning I would edit East Side Sushi while I was commuting and it was very cramped, and then I would edit at work, and then I would come home, and I would edit all day, and that's how I did it for most of the year. All right, so I submit the film to Sundance. Everybody wants to get into Sundance. That's everybody's dream and goal. You do a feature film, you get into Sundance. So uh, we got, I was jumping on a plane to take my first vacation after making the film, editing the film, I'm gonna take a vacation. And I get on the plane, and I check my phone just before takeoff, and it's from Sundance. It's like, you are not accepted. I thought, oh. So it ruined a big part of my vacation. And I thought, I'm done, that's it. I've just spent all my money. I did not get the George Lucas bonus, and I'm, I'm done. <laughs> and, uh, and then more rejections started to happen after that. Boom, 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 the hits started to happen. And then I, I watched this film shortly after that called uh, 20 Feet from Stardom. And there's a theme, uh, scene where Darlene Love, she's this phenomenal singer, and she's, she's there cleaning houses after having this great career. And she hears her song playing and she's like, that is not my destiny. And, and she walks out, and, and I needed to hear that at that moment, because I thought, okay, this is not my destiny. This will not be the destiny of my film. It's got legs, it's gonna keep going. So I think just that mode of thought, just that, that change of thought, I immediately got into Cinequest Film Festival right after that. So once we got into uh, Cinequest, we won that festival, and then it sort of, it took off. So then we won more festivals, and I ended up talking to the head of a studio for distribution. And it was a big studio, and I thought, this is great, they're interested. So I talked to him on the phone, and he's like, look, I love the film, my wife loves your film, my staff loves your film, we talked about it this morning, we can't take it on. We need a, a, a face, we need a face to put up on a billboard that people recognize, and your film doesn't have that, it doesn't have names attached. And that was the running theme for my film for the next year. It was like, nope, it's, there's nobody famous in this film. So uh, we go to the uh, Napa Valley Film Festival, and this comes out from The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, endearing performances, accomplished low-budget filmmaking, and a distinctive urban setting all add up to an appetizing offering that should entice both theatrical and ancillary <laughs> buyers, right? <laughs> that was amazing from just, thank you, Justin Lowe. Um, should entice both theatrical and ancillary buyers. I read that and I thought, oh my God, this reporter just sold my film for me. And it was quiet after that, still nothing. I mean, I would get these offers from small distribution companies, but it was just, it wasn't the ones I wanted. So 
Um, and it, it got a little depressing because the more wins we got, we ended up winning 13 film festivals, and I still wasn't getting what we needed. So I had this company, uh, Leroy and Rose, they volunteered to make, redo my poster. And then once we did this, I don't know what happened, but it caught a lot of people's attention. And then we started to get the people that I wanted to get to contact me for the film. So, um, so thank you, Leroy and Rose, they volunteered. And, and they made that. So, but yeah, the only difference between me and my other colleagues that didn't make a film, or you and the person sitting next to you, is just drive and resilience. That's, that's all it is. Um, yeah, and a little bit of ignorance. I mean, really, like ignorance goes a long ways. Because I mean, honestly, had I known how difficult this this ride would have been, um, I I might not have done it. I mean, it was it was very painful. But but I don't want to confuse the word painful for for horrible, okay? It was a very painful process to go through, but it was a very beautiful process to go through. And, and uh, yeah, so had I listened to that very early on, I, I would have never have uh, turned that into that. So that's my little bragging moment for the day. That's a screenshot from my phone from iTunes. And that is how I turned an idea into reality. So thank you.